Hello, I'm Henry, and I read a book. I read this book, Birdsong by Sebastian Fawkes, and I would like to talk about it, please. Over the course of this video, I will be outing myself as two things. One, a complete noob when it comes to romance novels, and two, a clinical psychopath, maybe. Both those things are me problems, not this book's, but it did sort of bring them to the surface. In order to get fully invested with the emotions of others, you need to be able to empathise with them. You need to be able to put yourself in their shoes and maybe not feel exactly what they're feeling, but at least understand what they are feeling, why they are feeling those things, where those feelings are coming from. In the process of reading this book, I found I couldn't quite do that, and not being able to understand the feelings and emotions of others is one of the traits of a psychopath, so... As this book's two primary characters were falling in love, I felt things were progressing very quickly. Things got very out of hand in a very short space of time, and I couldn't quite get into the heads of these two people. I couldn't quite understand why they were acting the way they were. I just felt their actions were quite rash for the length of time that they'd spent in each other's company. Again, this is a me problem, not this book's as is my inexperience with the romance genre as a whole. I genuinely don't know if they're all like this, and that more down-to-earth, realistic, prolonged forms of falling in love are in the vast minority, in which case I would look like an even bigger fool than I already do. But I kind of want to at least attempt to defend myself here. So what I've done is diaried day to day, the interactions and activities of our two main characters as they fall in love. And I'll leave it for you to decide whether this love springs up a little too quickly or if it's all just totally fine and I'm just being overly analytical for no reason. First though, mini review. The premise of this video is to be as reductive as possible, so this needs to be said before we get to any of that. This book is amazing. It's got sort of three things going on in it, and while each has their own weaknesses, their positives far outweigh them. The first is the romance, and you can probably tell what I think the negative is there. It's a, it's a little too quick, but that doesn't stop it being tense, emotional, compelling, sensual. I said I couldn't quite understand why these characters were feeling the way they were, but that didn't stop me from rooting for them, and... <clears throat> Isabel settled herself luxuriously on the feeling of impalement. It's certainly one of the lines of all time. The second thing is World War One, which is the main reason I bought this book in the first place. I love World War One, but well, I don't love World War One. Obviously, forty million people died. I love stories set in World War One, and the World War One we get here is something else. It is just so harrowing. I'm well within a desensitized internet generation, and I had to stop a couple of times reading this and just sit there like. Oof. The description of wounds and damage to the human body is so gory and graphic and realistic and it's all different as well. I didn't know a person could be mangled in all these unique ways. It can be a bit sort of wheel spinny at times, a bit boring and a bit mundane, but that just adds to the uncomfortable, itchy tension. The third part of the book is a flash forward to the 70s. It was a bit of a shock when I saw this. It follows the granddaughter of our love interests as she finds her grandfather's letters and learns about his life. This is the weakest part of the book, if you ask me, feeling like a bit of a side quest, but it does have important themes of recovering history and remembrance, and instills this quite overwhelming sense of guilt. You've just read about some of the most horrifying things humans have ever done to each other, first hand in complete detail and suddenly it's a lady just going about her life in London and it's like should anyone be able to go about their life after what happened? Should I? Sign of a good book if it makes you question yourself. And then we get to the bottom of page 124 and we get one word that single-handedly brings this book up from an 8 out of 10 to a 10 out of 10. Ed Mun Tun. One of the characters is from Edmonton. When I first read this I was like don't panic Canadians were in World War One, and there's an Edmonton in Canada. It's even got a hockey team and everything. So this is probably that. But no. Three pages later, Tot N. -hum. This Edmonton is Edmonton Edmonton. N9. Gucci Armani from the waist up. My, my entire family is from Edmonton. That's why I'm going a bit mental here. I guess I'm technically not because my parents got out of there sharpish, but the roots are there. It's not just Edmonton and Tottenham though. We get we get Turnpike Lane, Manor House, Seven Sisters, and I'm like, Sebastian Falls, what are you doing to me, man? This feels targeted. You're making my little North London heart sing. I don't normally Google where the author is exactly from, but I had to here just in case he's from Enfield or Haringey or something. 
he isn't. Speaking of the author, I should probably also mention that the writing itself is superb, being thick and creamy or raw and jagged whenever it needs to be, building to the brutal and the steamy with such tension and anticipation that there is palpable relief when it gets to each of the deeds, albeit most of the time not a positive relief, which is totally by design. And that contrasts perfectly with the periods of rooting mundanity or poetic spectacle. So yeah, pretty brilliant book. So before we take apart how our lovebirds, <laughs> birds, fall in love, I should probably introduce them and their circumstances. They are Stephen Raisford and Isabel Azaire. Stephen is an Englishman in his early 20s. He works for a textile company in England and travels to France to observe how French textile factories operate. He stays with the factory's owner and his family where he meets the owner's wife, Isabel. Isabel is a woman in her 30s, the stepmother of the factory owner's two children with no children of her own. Her marriage is not a pleasant one, being boring, joyless, and outright abusive. These are the two we are working with. Now let's get down to chronicling the 18 days it takes for these two to fall so madly in love that they upend their entire lives. Day one, Stephen Raceford arrives in Amiens and the home of the Azir family with whom he has dinner. Here he meets Isabel Azir, though he speaks mostly to her husband. While we do get a description of her from Stephen's point of view, it's matter of fact with little opinion thrown in. And it states he doesn't make eye contact contact with her. And then one of her husband's insufferable friends shows up and sort of hijacks the evening. We get a small story from Isabel about a song she heard while out in town, but again it isn't directed at Stephen. He does wonder about her age as he doesn't know it yet, and is impressed with how she handles her husband's friend. Then, dun dun dun, she speaks to Stephen properly and him to her. They make eye contact, but before the spark could fly, the friend starts singing. Makes Isabel uncomfortable and she goes to bed. Later that night, Stephen overhears Isabel getting abused by her husband and then writes in his journal with the chapter ending with the line, he saw with some surprise that what had struck him the most he had not written about at all. So there you go, 1910 meet cute accomplished. Clearly Isabel has caught Stephen's eye with very minimal effort. She has said 19 words to him and him 26 words to her and they have made eye contact once. The pot is on the boil, people. Dear two in the big French house. Stephen gets a tour of the French textile factory he is actually there to observe. Isabel isn't there, but Steve does end up thinking about her, wondering about her age again. Then uses the code word pulse when writing about her in his journal. Again, at this point, there have been 45 words total exchanged between the two of them. So my man suddenly becoming some kind of doe-eyed Alan Turing feels a bit over Killy. Days three to eight. For the next six days, Stephen, for want of a better word, creeps on Isabel. We get very detailed descriptions of her appearance, her clothes, her routines, her behavior. These descriptions are overtly, if not sensual in nature, I think probably intense would be the word I would go for. They are not neutral. They are clearly coming from someone who has some feelings stirring. And it feels quite a lot, a bit much, if you know what I mean. He's known her for a maximum of eight days at this point and not really gotten to know her at all. And yet he's describing her like some kind of muse. She's also stated to be formal with him, which I'm assuming means conversationally as well as socially. So they have spoken more, I would say, though nothing important enough to get the actual conversation in dialogue. But any more is better than the 45 words we had previously. Day nine, Stephen has lunch with the workers of the factory instead of somewhere else, I guess. Nothing else happens. Day 10, tumbleweed. Day 11. At lunch with the workers, Stephen chucks a bit of a wobbly and sort of runs away feeling faint. Day 12. Things really hit a higher gear. Mr. Azair asks Stephen how he's doing sort of one too many times and Isabel's had enough. She, she jumps to Stephen's defense, I guess, with a bit of an outburst. And a few lines later, Stephen makes her laugh. This is it. This is what I'd call the first connective moment between the two of them. Mr. Azale's insufferable friend shows back up and they decide to pencil in a fishing trip for Sunday. Day 13, some more creeping on Stephen's part with more overt comments to Isabel's attractiveness. Then they have a little moment in the garden whilst pruning. They speak, her arm brushes the front of his jacket, her hand briefly touches his, and we find out Isabel is the children's stepmother. Then my man shoots his sort of half shot. He takes her hand, he looks her in the eye, and he tells her that he heard the sounds of her 
husband abusing her. She, she asks him to let go, though sort of half-heartedly and blushing, and he eventually does. It is very clear from this interaction that there are mutual feelings between the two of them. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why. We're 13 days in at this point, or I should say, only 13 days in. And they have barely spoken to each other. And Steve thinks that's enough time and interaction to start putting the moves on a married woman. We've seen and heard very little of Isabel other than that she is attractive. But that seems to be enough for Stephen to attempt to initiate adultery. Which is still a crime in France at the time this story is set and will still be a crime for 65 more years. And the situation is even stranger when we look at the reverse. Stephen is incredibly passive quiet and boring at this stage of the story and is not described as some kind of handsome statuesque man. He's 20. He's a boy basically. I understand that Isabel's domestic situation is awful and she's most likely and rightfully desperate for a way out or at least a distraction. And I know I need to tread carefully because domestic violence is no joke and will absolutely affect the way that you think if you are a victim of it. But we later find out that it's been going on since way before Stephen showed up. I don't really see how he is the man that she sees as the, the way out or the distraction. Is there no one else, any man with at least half a personality? Why is it this grey English shape of a person who she's known for less than two weeks that she wants to hitch her wagon to? He's done nothing. Day 14, having lunch in a cafe, Stephen spots Isabel and runs her down like Chandler chasing Kathy. Turns out she's out delivering groceries and supplies to the leader of a workers' strike to be handed out to the striking workers who are no longer getting paid. Workers striking from her husband factory. This is an incredibly kind and brave thing to do and should be a huge thing that endears Isabel to Stephen. But he doesn't really comment on the moral quality of what she's doing. He just gets a little jealous with her relationship with the strike leader. It's now that we get a sort of aside where we get Isabel's entire backstory and how she ended up with Mr. Azale. It provides some context to some of her romantic and emotional naivete despite her age, though that really only reinforces my point from a moment ago. If she has the capacity to be led away from her husband, why is it that it's one of the neutrals from Futurama that does it? Well, we get her perspective on Stephen here too. He scares her, which comes across as sort of half actually fearful, half sort of exciting. Though I can't really see why. He's not this daring, dashing rogue, he's just a guy. Day 15, the day of the fishing trip. More Steve-O creeping. He spends most of the trip staring at Isabel, and not once does he comment on the actual character depth she showed the day before with the strike guy. Their legs touch in the boat, and it's all very steamy. Day 16, Steve gets a telegram from London telling him to come back. He does not. Day 17, there is a small riot at the factory that Stephen finds himself in the middle of. He gives as good as he gets, taking a couple of punches and throwing a couple of his own. Especially when people start saying mean things about the boss's wife. Isabel isn't there, however, to witness this sort of lame, flailing gallantry. Then, after, when he gets home, we get the first use of the L word. In the draft of a letter he is writing home, he says he has fallen in love with Isabel. 17 days, about four and a half conversations, and our boy is in love. I've had more conversations with the lady who takes the order at my local pizza union, and I've been going there for over two years. Do you see the issue here? Day 18, this is it. The day of reckoning. Steve and Izzy sleep together. <gasps> they get a little tipsy at lunch, and he grabs her. She says, no please no, which is a whole bunch of problems in his own right. And then she starts crying and those problems build. She goes to say, I hardly know you, but changes her mind. And that little moment of self-awareness right there is I think is justification for this whole video. But also quite scary when you realize it's the characters themselves agreeing with me. He tells her he loves her. She runs away. Then she comes back, they meet in another room. She tells him she loves him and they have sex. It isn't until after all of that is done that Isabel says Stephen's first name out loud for the first time. I think that fact sums up everything I'm trying to say here. This isn't passion, I should say now. Well, obviously it's passion. It isn't just passion. Based on how things progress after day 18, which we won't be going into now, these two people, Stephen and Isabel, are actually in love. They have somehow managed to fall in love in the space of 18 days without really speaking to each other 
without even saying each other's name. That is efficient, if nothing else. Stephen and Isabel then do a runner. Isabel gets pregnant, but then she panics and then does a solo runner. And then a guy gets shot in Sarajevo and things sort of spiral from there. Read the book, it's good. Obviously, I am being overly critical, overly analytical, and as I said in the review, incredibly reductive. And I understand that this is a different time, that social norms change, that looking at this through a modern lens isn't exactly fair. But this isn't Austin's English countryside, where everything was what you didn't say, it was all the lines between the lines. This is the 20th century. I just don't think 18 days and minimal words is enough. Though the fact that Steve and Isabel were able to fall in love in such little time with such little interaction, only 100 years ago, makes me think that we should be able to fall in love in seconds via brainwaves now. Which I suppose is what an online parasocial relationship, oh Jesus. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks a lot for getting to the end of the video. Like and subscribe. It's becoming a tradition that I record these outros with a Tottenham game on the telly here. The Man United one. I will be shocked beyond belief if in two seasons Mickey van der Ven isn't playing for Real Madrid.